Good morning. We're in lesson 27 of our study of the book of Revelation, and we're in chapter 11. And last week we ended halfway through verse 18. So we'll be picking up with the second half of verse 18 in chapter 11 in just a moment. There is a handout today. It's out in the back there. If you didn't pick one up, you might find interesting for a part of our lesson today. Uh, let me remind you that the handouts and also audio copies of all these classes are available on the internet at the webpage at the bottom of the handout, which is www.revelation.study.study. Um, we also have there our lessons that we did on Zechariah, which we studied right before Revelation, and we also have available there the lessons we did on Daniel that we studied a few years ago. Uh, both of those books, of course, are very important in our study of Revelation. Uh, let's begin our class with a prayer. Our dear Father in Heaven, we're thankful for this beautiful day you've given us, Father. We're thankful for this opportunity we have to come and study your Word. We're thankful for this wonderful book of Revelation that you've given us so that we can know about your love for your church, Father, and, and, and all that you've done for your church and are continuing to do for, it, for us, Father. We're thankful for, for your Son and for all that he means to us and to this world, Father, and we're thankful that he is our King. And We pray these things in his name. Amen. So let's pick up then in verse 18 of chapter 11. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldst give, give reward unto the servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and should destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. As I said, last week we were looking at the first half of verse 18 when we ended. So let's begin this week by looking at the second half of that verse that we just read. And the time of the dead that they should be judged and thou shouldst give reward unto thy servants the prophets and to the saints and to them that fear thy name both small and great. Okay, you may say, time frame or no time frame, verse 18 must be the end of the world, right? Well, no, it doesn't have to be. And assuming we don't throw our time frame right out the window, we shouldn't uh, be too quick to leap thousands of years ahead into the future in the context in which we see verse 18, because we're looking right here at the conflict between the church and Rome in the first century. But how can we make sense of verse 18 and remain consistent with our time frame that we saw in the very first verse of the book, chapter 1, verse 1? We saw it in chapter 1, verse 3. We'll see it at the end in chapter 22, verse 6, in chapter 22, verse 10. How can we remain consistent with that time frame when looking at verse 18? Well, several ways. First, we need to remember how other judgments in the Bible have been described, both Old Testament judgments and judgments in the New Testament. Particularly, I'm thinking of the judgment of Jerusalem that we read about in Matthew 24. When we recall those descriptions, I think we'll discover that the language used here is very similar to those descriptions, and they weren't describing the end of the world. If the language used here is used as it was with those other judgments, and I think what we conclude is that this is also describing some judgment that occurred against an enemy of God's people, in this case Rome. Not Jerusalem, not Babylon as those other judgments did, but now we're talking about Rome. After all, is verse 18 speaking of Rome really that different from Matthew 24 verse 30, which we know is speaking of Jerusalem? Matthew 24 verse 30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with great power and glory. We know with certainty that that verse is not talking about the end of the world, because Matthew 24, verse 30 is followed by verse 34, which says everything that happened before happened in the lifetime of Jesus' listeners in the first century. If that occurred in the first century, then why not what we're looking at here in Revelation chapter 11? Yes, one day there will be a literal judgment of all men on the last great day. That will happen, literally, someday. It hadn't happened yet. It's coming. We know that will literally happen someday. But God figuratively comes in judgment against people when He comes in judgment against nations, for example. That's how it's described in Matthew 24, as a coming of Christ against Jerusalem in judgment. And I think that's what we're looking at here with regard to Rome. That's my first point. My second point about this judgment in verse 18 is that Hebrews 9.27 tells us we all have an appointment with death. Everybody. Everybody. 
Unless we're alive when Jesus comes again, we're all going to die. That's true today, and it was also true in the first century. Uh, Christians died and Romans died. Those Christians who remained faithful unto death received a crown of glory, a crown of righteousness when they died. Those Romans who rejected God and persecuted the church, they received wrath and indignation when they died. When did they receive those things? When did they receive wrath and indignation? When did they, when did they receive this crown of glory? Did they receive it in the first century, or is that all yet still to come? Well, in one sense, it certainly is all yet still to come. Um, on that last great day, Christ will judge this world. Some will hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Others will hear, I never knew you. But let me ask you this. For anyone who's hearing that on the last great day and who had previously died, will that sentence come as a surprise to that person? And the answer is no. Because at the moment of their death, they already knew their eternal destiny. Uh, you know, whether we believe that, that the dead in Christ are with Abraham, as was certainly true prior to the cross, or the dead in Christ are with Christ, however we fall on that question, I think we can all agree that at the moment of their death, they know their eternal destiny, just like the rich man in Lazarus. He woke up and he realized where he was. And so, so, did, so did Lazarus. So, at, in that sense, in that sense, they were sentenced at the moment of their death. They knew where they were going to end, spend eternity. Yes, at one point, some point later, yet to come, they will be raised and they will hear it again. They will stand before the judgment seat. They will bend their knee. But it's not going to come as a surprise to them. They're going to already know their eternal destiny. That's what the Bible teaches. So at least in that sense, the judgment of the Romans happened at the moment of their death. When that emperor Domitian or that emperor Nero died, they, like, like the rich man in Lazarus, they, like the rich man, lifted up their eyes and they knew where they were. They knew that this was not a good place. So later, when Nero and Domitian are, are, are raised to, to, to bend their knee before Christ, that hadn't happened yet, but someday it will, they're not going to be shocked at the judgment they hear, because they've already been spending time there since the moment of their death. As soon as a Roman persecutor died, as soon as those Roman emperors died, that person knew they'd been weighed in the balance and found wanting. And that was a first century realization, wasn't it? Perhaps that's what verse 18, the text here, has in mind when it refers to the time of the dead, the time of the dead. Rome was judged in the first century, and perhaps much of that judgment involved the individual judgments of God against the individual Romans that occurred at the moment of their death. You know, we've talked a lot about the judgment of a nation, the judgment of the nation of, of Rome, the empire of Rome. But in the end, aren't all judgments personal judgments? Individual judgments? Nations are not lost or saved. People are lost or saved. At the end, it all comes down to individual judgments. That's my second point. My third point is to recall something we discussed in our introduction and something we've already seen in the study of our text, and that is that sometimes a literal event is used as a figure for some other event. We've seen that with regard to literal past events. Literally, Egypt was beset by plagues. That happened literally in the Exodus and with Moses. But we've seen those very same literal plagues used figuratively when it comes to describing Rome. So sometimes a literal event is used figuratively to describe something else. We've seen it with a literal past event. Maybe we're seeing it here with a literal future event. That the literal judgment of the world at the end of time is being used as a figure to show what's in store for Rome. And I think that is something that's going on here, and I think that's something we're going to see later in the text also, when we get to some other passages, such as those in chapter 20. If that's the case, then what we read tells us not just something about Rome, but it tells us something about that literal event that hasn't happened yet, that is the end of the world. So if that's the case, when we read the text here, we can learn something both about Rome 
and something about the end of the world, the end of all time. We just need to be careful and make sure we're interpreting things in view of our time frame and in view of our context. Those are three points to think about, and we're going to come back to them because this is just the first of some other verses we're going to get to, where people are going to be tempted to say, aha, now it's finally time for us to leap ahead millennia. You know, I'm not a big fan of that because I think the time frame's important, but I think we can learn something about these events by looking at them uh, in view of their time frame and context. Whenever verse 18 is happening, the message is clear. Christ's enemies will be judged and destroyed, and Christ's faithful servants will be rewarded. That's the message, and that's what the church needed to hear in the first century. Notice that the prophets are among those who are rewarded in verse 18. They had looked forward to, they had foretold the coming of the eternal kingdom, and now their reward is to see those prophecies fulfilled. Their reward is to witness the unfolding of this mystery of God that we, re we, we studied in, in chapter 10. Their reward is to witness the vindication of God's people. Can't we just picture Daniel watching this? Can't we just picture Zechariah watching this after we've studied those beautiful books of Daniel and Zechariah? Can't we just picture them looking and watching and seeing this unfold before them? It's a beautiful image when we go back and think about all that they said and all that they wrote. What about that phrase at the end of verse 18? And shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. What does that mean? Well, Thayer tells us that to destroy does not mean to extinguish or bring to extinction, but it means to change for the worse or to corrupt. That's what he tells us this word means. The same way that a moth would corrupt a garment in Luke 12, 33, or evil dispositions corrupt minds in 1 Timothy 6, verse 5. Was that true of Rome? Absolutely. Rome had corrupted the earth, but now the tables were turned on Rome. God's people would put on incorruption, 1 Corinthians 15, 54, on that last great day, but not so with Rome. God's people have escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, 2 Peter 1, verse 4, but not so with Rome. Rome was about to reap corruption, Galatians 6, verse 8. Why? Because of Galatians 6, verse 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. That is why Rome was about to reap corruption, as the very next verse in Galatians discusses. They had sown corruption. They were going to reap corruption. Finally, why are we shown the Ark of the Covenant in verse 19? And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the Ark of his Testament. That Ark of the Covenant, as we know, was located in the Holy of Holies, inside which no ordinary person was ever allowed to go. In fact, when the, the high priest went in there, they'd tie a rope around his foot, so if he died, they could drag him out. I mean, that was not a place for ordinary people to go. Um, but that temple was now destroyed. And that Ark of the Covenant hadn't been seen or heard from since the Babylonian captivity. Why do we see the Ark of the Covenant here? The Ark of the Covenant is here to provide reassurance. Remember why, we're even, why we even have this book. We have this book to provide comfort and reassurance to the poor, poor, persecuted saints of God. And this Ark of the Covenant is to provide reassurance to them of what? That God remembers His promises. God remembers his promises. This ark is pictured as always being in the presence of God to remind God of his promises and his covenants. Whatever the terror to come, God will not forget his promises. God will not forget his people. God will not forget his covenants. That's why the ark is pictured here. In a similar way, we see thunder, lightning, earthquakes, hail in this verse. Those are all Old Testament symbols of judgment. And they're intended to remind us of those judgments. And those judgments are reminders also that God keeps his promises. God keeps his promises. God promised to judge and punish the church's enemies. God promised the church would sweep away all the kingdoms of this world, including, including the Roman Empire, Daniel 2.44. God had promised those things. God would keep his promises. 
we're being called, God's people at this time, and all of us are being called on here to remember that God keeps his promises and God has that ark in front of him and, and the thunder and the lightnings, the old judgments, all intended to tell us that. And isn't that something the early church needed to hear? They hadn't been forgotten. God remembered them and God remembered what he had said. In fact, verse 19 is a confirmation that God has, past tense, kept his promises because this is all coming after the sounding of the seventh trumpet. And in the sounding of the seventh trumpet, that was marking the judgment of Rome because that included the seven seals that are about to be poured out on Rome. The church has triumphed. Rome has been defeated. God has remembered his promises. And that's how beautiful chapter 11 ends that we've been studying for several weeks now. Questions about chapter 11? Chapter 12, verse 1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. Chapter 12 begins with a great wonder or a great sign in heaven. In the gospel accounts, John would usually use the same word here, this translated sign, where the other gospel account writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, would use the Greek word usually translated miracle. So this is a word that John used also in his gospel account. Um, in fact, this same Greek word for sign occurs seven times in the book of Revelation. Three times in reference to God, four times in reference to false signs by Rome. This sign in verse 1, of course, is a sign from God. Sign from God. And the first thing we see in this great sign is this woman clothed with the sun, the moon at her feet, and wearing a crown of 12 stars. Well, who is this woman? Well, as we always do with such questions, we need to start by looking at the clues that are given to us in the text itself. So what are the clues? Well, she's clothed with the sun. She has the moon under her feet. Third, she's wearing a crown. And fourth, this crown has 12 stars on it. Well, let's start with the last of those clues first, because we know that clue, 12, 12 stars. We've seen the symbol 12 before in this book. We know what that symbol means. That symbol is a symbol for God's people, both in the Old Testament and in the New. We have the 12 patriarchs, we have the 12 tribes, we have the 12 apostles. So we should expect this woman in verse 1 to depict in some way and at some time the faithful people of God. Because when we see the number 12, that's what we think about and that's what we're intended to think about. But what else do we see? We see the sun, the moon, and the stars. Sun, the moon, and the stars. Where else in the Bible do we see those same three symbols used closely together to describe something about the faithful people of God? And the answer is Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31. We're all familiar with Jeremiah 31, verse 31. That should be a verse that's in our Rolodex. <laughs> Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. That's one of those famous new covenant verses in the Old Testament. Jeremiah 31, 31. But right after that description of the new covenant in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34... We then get to verses 35 and 36 of Jeremiah 31. And there, God makes it very clear that the new covenant did not mean that God was going to turn his back on everybody under the old covenant. If they were faithful people under the old covenant, then God was going to take care of them under the new covenant. In fact, we know that the gospel of the new covenant is the power of salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Romans 1.16. So listen as Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 31, 35 and 36, describes this very same thing. What's going to happen to the people under the old covenant when this new covenant comes that I just announced in Jeremiah 31, 31? Well, Jeremiah answers that question in Jeremiah 31, 35 and 36. Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for light by day, and the ordinances of the moon and of the stars for a light by night. There we have it, the moon, the sun, and the stars. 
which divideth the sea when the waves thereof roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. The sun, the moon, the stars. God pointed to those heavenly ordinances, as the text calls them in Jeremiah 31, as evidence that he would not forget his people under the old covenant, his faithful people under the old covenant, when the new covenant came along. He said, the sun, the moon, and the stars are going to go away before that happens. That's what he pointed to. And here in Revelation 12, we see the people of God and those same three heavenly ordinances, the sun, the moon, and the stars. We have one textual clue remaining in verse 1. The crown, the crown. What would that crown make this woman? Not a king but a queen, a queen. In verse 2, we see this woman delivering a child. In verse 5, we'll see that this child is a male child, a son. What do you call the son of a queen? You call him a king, a king. And in fact, this woman is giving birth to a king. This woman is giving birth to royalty. That's why she's wearing a crown. So who is this woman in verse 1? Is she the church? Well, yes and no. Yes and no to that one. Yes, in the sense that the faithful people of God under both the Old Covenant and under the New Covenant are now a part of God's eternal kingdom, the church that was established in Acts chapter 2. In fact, the Old Testament prophets are part of the foundation of the church, Ephesians 2 verse 20. So why yes and no? I say yes and no because although those under the old covenant became a part of the church when it was established, I think we're looking here at a time prior to the establishment of the church. Verse 1 is describing the faithful people of God under the old covenant. The child has not even been born yet. Not in verse 1. Perhaps that's why we're seeing 12 here instead of 24. Remember we've seen 24 before and we said, well that's Old Covenant and New Covenant. And we've seen 144,000, which also involves a couple of 12s. And that's Old Covenant and New Covenant. Here we just see 12. I think at this point we're just looking at the Old Covenant, under the Old Covenant. God's faithful people under the Old Covenant. And that makes sense with the other clues as well. Jeremiah 31, 35, and 36, the sun, the moon, and the stars. That was addressed to God's faithful people under the Old Covenant who were wondering about their position under the New Covenant. The answer to that concern in Jeremiah is the same as Paul's answer to the same concern in Romans 9, 4, and 5. Who are the Israelites? To whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the prophets? Whose are the fathers? And of whom concerning the flesh Christ came? who is over all, God bless forever. Notice what Paul adds there at the end of verse 5 in Romans chapter 9. Of whom as concerning the flesh, Christ came. Christ came from them concerning the flesh. I think that's the same point that Revelation 12 is making. I think the child in Romans 9, 5 is the same child we see in Revelation 12 verse 2. The child Jesus who came from the faithful people of God under the old covenant. He came to bring salvation under the new covenant to the Jew first and also to the Greek. We see messianic prophecies in the Old Testament that are very similar to what we see here in Revelation 12, 1 and 2. Isaiah 66, verse 7, Before she travailed, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she was delivered of a man-child. Micah 4, verse 10, Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in travail. For now shalt thou go forth out of the city, and thou shalt dwell in the field, and thou shalt go even to Babylon. There shalt thou be delivered. There the Lord shall redeem thee from the hand of thine enemies. And what do we see in the very next chapter of Micah? The very next chapter of Micah, chapter 5, verse 2. But thou, Bethlehem, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me, that is to be ruler of Israel, whose going forth have been from old, from everlasting. The coming child, Christ. So what's the point of Revelations 12, 1 and 2? 
The point is that Jesus did not appear on this earth fully grown. Jesus came as a baby in a manger, born of woman. Galatians 4, verse 4. This woman in Revelation 12, she's not Mary, but she includes Mary. This woman in Revelation 12, they're the faithful people of God under the Old Covenant, which included Mary, but included many others also. Why did God bring his faithful people out of Jeruz- uh, out, uh, back to Jerusalem, out of Babylonian captivity? We studied all about that when we studied Israel, Wh- Ezra rather. Why did that happen? Why did God do that? Because the faithful people of God had to be living in Jerusalem in the first century for the promises to be fulfilled. God had promised the coming Messiah. God had said his word would go out from Jerusalem. That all had to happen. And God was depending upon his faithful people under the old covenant for that to all come to pass. That's why it was so important for them to be faithful and to remain true to God and to look for the coming Messiah. God's promises depended upon that. And I think it's those faithful people we're seeing here in the opening verse of Revelation 12. So I think the woman here in verse 1 represents the faithful people of God under the Old Covenant. Will that remain the case for the entirety of the chapter? Well, maybe not. We need to be on the lookout because after this child comes, we may be looking at a different covenant. I think we will be. But right now, I think we're still looking at the Old Covenant. The child has not been delivered. So who then is the child in verse 2? No one who's read this far in the Bible could have any doubt about the identity of this child in verse 2. This child is Jesus, who descended from God's people under the Old Covenant, God's faithful people under the Old Covenant, uh, according to the flesh. We will witness the birth of this child in verse 5. This child is the royal child of Micah 5, verse 2 that we just read a moment ago, out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth had been from of old, from everlasting. That explains the crown on this woman's head. Out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel. King. Yes, Jesus came from the womb of Mary. But more broadly, Jesus came from the womb of those faithful Jews who had been living faithfully under the old covenant and who had been awaiting the promised Messiah. People like Simeon, who was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, Luke 2.25. Some of the most beautiful and dramatic images found anywhere in the Bible are found right here in chapter 12. The destiny of this woman depends upon this child of promise. And what could be more helpless than a newborn baby? But surely no one would seek to harm a newborn baby, right? Wrong. On to verse 3. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Verse 3 reminds me of a quote by one of my very favorite authors, J.R.R. Tolkien. And if all you know about Tolkien is from some movies, and you don't know anything about Tolkien, so you need to read those books and don't watch the movies. Tolkien once wrote, it does not do to leave a live dragon out of your calculations if you live near him. Okay, we got a live dragon right here in this verse, and this one looks pretty fierce. That's good advice for us here in Revelation 12, because here in verses 3 and 4, we meet a powerful bloodthirsty dragon who appears before this woman with one goal in mind, devour that child as soon as it's born. Where have we seen this same cast of characters before? To answer that question, we turn from the last book in the Bible to the first book in the Bible. Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, thou shalt bruise his heel. This battle's been going on for a long, long time. And guess what? It's head bruising time. 
This child has been in the womb of God's faithful people since the opening chapters of the Bible, and now this child has arrived. And believe me, Satan knows what that means. Satan knows all about Genesis 3.15. Satan was there to hear it. And you know what? Satan knows more about the Bible than we do. Satan is a Bible scholar. So who is this great red dragon? Well, first, it's Satan, depicting Satan. I think more particularly it's depicting Satan with Rome in his hands, the great mighty weapon of Rome that Satan was going to use against the church, the Roman Empire. It would have been difficult to think of a more potent weapon than the mighty Roman Empire. And Satan had that weapon. Satan had that weapon. Satan was wielding that weapon. And John 8, tells us that Satan was a murderer from the beginning. This murderer is waiting in verse 4 to murder a newborn child with the most powerful weapon one could imagine on this earth anyway. Well, how do we know for sure that Rome is involved here? Well, we know that from the dragon's description in verse 3. Seven heads, ten horns, seven crowns upon his heads. Why seven? Why ten? Why horns? To those questions, I'm going to say, stay tuned. <laughs> stay tuned. We're going to see these same symbols again in chapter 13. And they are going to be explained to us by an angel in chapter 17. So we're not going to have any doubt about what they mean when we get to chapter 17. Because an angel from God is going to tell us what those symbols mean in chapter 17. And when we get there, we're going to see they precisely represent Rome. Now, we've already studied that because we looked at that in our study of Daniel. In fact, when we studied Daniel and we studied these same symbols, we leapt ahead and looked at chapter 13 and chapter 17 of Revelation. So when we get to those two chapters of Revelation, we're going to leap back and also look again at Daniel. So we've looked at this before, and we're going to look at this when we get to chapter 13 and 17. But this dragon is Rome, and this description fits Rome to a T. But even here in these verses, we get enough clues to get a glimpse of what we're going to discover in those later chapters about this dragon. Because the word crowns in verse 3, it occurs three times in the book of Revelation. It doesn't occur anywhere else in the New Testament. It's different from the crown of victory, Stephanos, that we looked at before. These crowns denote royal power or royal rule. Well, which royal rule is in view here? Well, who was reigning at the time on earth when this book was written, when this vision was received? What royalty was Satan using to attack the church? There can be only one answer to that. Rome. Rome. In fact, Satan is arrayed with the emperors of Rome in this picture that we're looking at here. He is using them to de try to destroy and to attack the church. And it was through their reign that Satan sought to destroy the church in its infancy. What are the stars of heaven in verse 4 that are cast down by this dragon? Well, sadly, I think they represent the people of God, or some of them. Why sadly? Well, because the dragon causes some of them to fall to the earth. The word translated cast in verse 4 means to drag away, to pull away. Are they people in the church who fell away? Well, I think the timing here suggests not. I think the timing is still under the old covenant. I think these are faithful people under the old covenant who proved faithless that fell away. People who did not continue to faithfully await the Messiah. Remember, in verse 4, the woman has not yet given birth to her son. But while this description is focused on those who fell away under the old covenant, I think it has a lesson for those who are tempted to fall away under the new covenant. Didn't we read about such fallen stars in Revelation 2 and Revelation 3? It was through Roman persecution and emperor worship that Satan caused some, not all, but some Christians to fall away and to compromise with this world. These stars did not fall when they died physically. They, st they fell when they turned from Jesus and they died spiritually. Luke 9, 24, Matthew 13, 20 through 21. Some did not endure faithfully to the end. But although Satan caused some to fall away, he did not cause all to fall away. Just as a third was used earlier to show partial judgments, 
We see a third here to show Satan also had a partial success. He caused some to fall away, but not all to fall away. In fact, not even the majority to fall away. If we take a third to, to tell us that. And how important that was. We've talked about it. How important that was. If all of God's people had fall away, fallen away, then how could Jesus have come into the world? Where would God have found Mary? Where would God have found Joseph? Where would God have found John the baptizer? Where would God have found the apostles? God was depending upon his faithful people under the old covenant to prepare the way for his son to bless the world under the new covenant. There's an important lesson for us here in verse 4. This dragon should not be underestimated. Yes, Satan's been defeated. Yes, Satan's just acting out a role that God has given for him in this book. But Satan is real. Satan is dangerous. Otherwise, why do we have all these warnings in the Bible about Satan? Satan causes people to fall away from God. And when that happens, it's like a star has fallen from heaven. Whether it's because of Roman persecution or it's just because some people have something they'd rather be doing on a Sunday morning. It's as if a star has fallen from heaven. All throughout this book, God is calling upon us to see things as he sees them. Many people say that the symbols in Revelation are describing things we can't see, and God is trying to explain them to us in terms of things we can understand. I think that has it all wrong. I think most of the symbols in Revelation are describing things we can see, but we're not seeing right. We can see the church, but are we seeing it correctly? We can see lost people, but are we seeing them correctly? We can see people who've fallen away from Christ, but are we seeing them correctly? Revelation is calling us to see things as God sees them, and when we see things as God sees them, then we're seeing them correctly. I fear we do not always see a Christian's fall from grace in the same cataclysmic terms in which God views that departure. It looks like such a non-event from our perspective. The person's here, and then he's sometimes here, and then he's never here, and then we ask about him, and then we don't ask about him, and then no one asks about him. It's just a drift. And what's dramatic about a drift? Drifting doesn't seem very dramatic, does it? That's how we see things, and we aren't seeing things correctly. Because that's not how God looks at it. That's not how God sees it. Perhaps we need to picture that person as a shining star cast down to earth by the tail of a great red dragon. Because that's how God sees it. Luke 15, 10, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Is that how we see things when one sinner repents? Angels rejoicing? If not, we're not seeing things correctly. The book of Revelation is many, many things, but I'll tell you right now, one thing it is, is an eye test. But was Rome really a great dragon waiting to devour the church? Is that an accurate depiction of Rome? Look at your handout. Handout shows some coins that were minted. The first two were minted during the reign of Domitian. Reigned at the end of the first century, fierce persecutor of God's people, an emperor yet to come when this vision was received. A third coin there was minted about 20 years later under the reign of Hadrian. You may recall the wall of Hadrian uh, that was built, started being built during his reign about 20 years after Domitian. On one of those coins, Domitian is referred to as Divi Filius, which means son of the divine or son of God. On the other coin, you see Domitian's own infant son, who died very young, referred to as the divine Caesar, son of the emperor Domitian. And look at what that child is doing, sitting on a globe, stretching out his hands to what? To seven stars, seven stars. A divine child who holds seven stars in his hand. Where have we seen that before? Revelation 1.16, speaking of Christ, he had in his right hand seven stars. And you can see seven stars on that third coin as well, the one that was minted just 20 years later. By the way, if you'd like to see the second and third of those, two, of those three coins, you can see me after class, those are 
two that I have. I don't have the top one. <clears throat> These similarities are unmistakable. The mission must have seen Christianity as a great threat to his own claims of divinity and to the claims of divinity for his own infant son. Remember what Paul had to say about the mission in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 4, who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Read that description and look at these coins. You might want to show these coins to someone who, who, who might argue that this book isn't about Rome at all. Look at the coins. Look at the evidence. Compare it with the text. Who can look at these coins and doubt that Rome and the church were on a collision course? Who is it that has the true royal son who holds the seven stars in his hand? Is it God or is it Domitian? Domitian thought it was him. Look at the coin. Domitian was mistaken. Here in chapter 12, a great red dragon waits to swallow up the Son of God. We know very little about Domitian's son except for one thing. He died in infancy. Certainly makes you wonder who swallowed up whom, doesn't it? We've been looking at those Egyptian plagues. I wonder if Domitian experienced the last of those plagues, literally. We'll have a lot more to say about Domitian as our study continues. In verse 4, this great red dragon stands before the woman waiting to devour her child as soon as he's born. To any outside observer, to anyone looking on this from outside, it must have looked like this child has no chance. Not little chance, but zero chance. None. How could anyone, much less a newborn baby, prevail against this mighty great red dragon? I'm sure the dragon had the same view. Who can defeat me? Surely not this little baby. I'm just going to swallow him right up, and that's going to be the end of that. Church didn't have a chance, did it? Wrong. Why? Because things are not what they seem. And that's our theme. Satan had once attempted to swallow up this child literally but with Herod the Great. But you know what? That was with Rome, wasn't it? Because Herod was ruling only because Rome let him rule. So that was with Rome. Satan had crucified this child. How? Using Roman hands. Rome again. Now Satan was once again trying to do the same thing to the body of Christ, the church, in its infancy, and once again through the power of Rome. Satan knew he would never have an opportunity like this again. Attack the church in its infancy with the greatest weapon he could muster, the mighty Roman Empire. Satan had been waiting to devour this child since Genesis chapter 3. Now was his chance. This devouring of God's people reminds us again of Old Testament imagery. Jeremiah 51, 34, Babylon swallowed God's people like a monster. Egypt also tried to devour a servant of God as a child, Moses. And Egypt also persecuted the people of God, like Rome did. And Egypt is called a great dragon in Ezekiel 29, verse 3. At the time of this book, Satan wasn't using Babylon anymore. Satan wasn't using Egypt anymore. Satan was using Rome, which was mightier than Egypt and mightier than Babylon. The nations had changed. The serpent had not changed. Still Satan. Target had not changed. The weapon had changed. Revelation is often looked at as a book that looks forward. But you know, don't we see it looking backward a lot? <laughs> don't we see Revelation looking back at the Old Testament a lot and calling us to look back at the Old Testament a lot to see things as what's going on here? God is often pointing backward in the book of Revelation, telling us, look back there and read that. Go back and look and read about Babylon. Go back there and look and read about Egypt and the plagues. Go back there and look and see how I judge Babylon. Uh, he's calling us to look back. And that's why we spent all that time studying Zechariah. That's why we spent all that time studying Daniel. 
That's why we spent all that time studying Ezra. Because God wants us to know these things, and they help us understand this book of Revelation. If you're ever looking at a commentary on Revelation, believe me, there are a lot of bad ones out there. But one way to tell one that might be a good one <laughs> is to look at the very back of the book where they'll give a list of all the scriptures that they've referenced in their commentary and look how often they've referenced the Old Testament. If it's very little, then that's not a good commentary on Revelation. This book is calling on us all throughout it to look back at the Old Testament. And if we don't know the Old Testament, we have no chance of understanding this book of Revelation. And so God is calling on us to do that and to look back at that. And when we do that, we see the faithful people of God working, working to prepare the way for the Son of God. Son of God. And in, in verse 5, which we'll start next week, this child will be born. And who will succeed? The child or the dragon? Next week, we'll start in verse 5. Thank you for your attention.